Mr. Yansha, thank you again very, very much for the honor you have given us by visiting the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy today. We really appreciated your lecture very much uh, just now upstairs. We'd like to take the chance now to go a little bit deeper into some of the issues that you discussed uh, and also a chance to learn uh, from your tremendous experience and also perspectives. So thank you again for coming. Uh, Dr. Nazar, yeah, I think would like yeah, to begin. Thank you very much again. It was uh, a very interesting lecture. Um, we have some questions here to ask you. The first question I have is, how do you see the situation in Syria? Are you optimistic about a political solution? And what's your opinion? Uh, I would be very glad if uh, we, we could be optimistic. Unfortunately, there is no uh, well, closeness of the final, final solution on the table. The international community was uh, well, able to stop those uh, atrocities at the beginning. But unfortunately, the <coughs> blocking situation in the Security Council of United Nations prevented such actions. Uh, well, the, the last resolution adopted uh, regarding the use of the chemical weapons showed that if the international community is uh, united, then also the regimes, as in this case the regime of uh, Mr. Assad, uh, are listening when the international community or the main, uh, main uh, influential factors of it are divided, then nobody is afraid of the United Nations and uh, the atrocities are going on. Uh, and this has also uh, very bad influence on other, uh, not the same, but similar situation across the globe. I'd like to move to Europe for a moment with the second question. The EU financial crisis is a major challenge for the development of the European Union and has brought uh, many members of the European Union into serious financial situations with significant rising unemployment. EU officials are working seriously uh, to challenge the, the situation, and we'd like to know what is your advice to them in the sense what else can be done in order to make the EU economy stronger to tackle the unemployment rate in the short as well as the long run? And in addition, what is your advice to those young people who are currently struggling to find jobs as a senior politician with your uh, level of experience? Maybe I should start with the last question, okay. which is concrete and uh, well, very important for the individuals. Uh, well, fortunately, the situation in the European Union is not uh, well uh, very serious in all parts of the Union. So we have countries where youth unemployment is huge historical problem, and we have countries where. Uh, and the employers are still looking for the for the young skilled people, and fortunately, with uh, well, Schengen area and uh, free movement of the people principle, uh, young generation is able to to move from one country to other country. Of course, the the responsibility of the national governments or, and the responsibility of the European institutions is to to create, you know, uh, well, not uh, totally equal, but but uh, comparable, good situation in all member countries for young people not to uh, to travel only because they they want to change uh, surroundings or to to get you know specific or better education somewhere else, but not uh, to move because they are pushed to, they are they are. Uh, forced to do it because there is no job, there is no, no, uh, there is no uh, conditions, good conditions for living uh, their home country. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, there are few advices for, <laughs> for, for them. One is that they should, uh, they should be active, they should do something, they, they should not be silent, they should do something. Uh, their home places, uh, their local communities, uh, their uh, uh, civil society organizations, to they, they, they should uh, push, they should press the domestic local governments to fight uh, youth unemployment more seriously. Because, uh, you know, last few years, 
have showed that those countries, when uh, local governments uh, took seriously this problem, youth unemployment is not a huge problem anymore. And there are some countries which are uh, normally also in uh, other troubles when youth unemployment is not only uh, or single uh, macroeconomic uh, problem, where uh, youth unemployment is uh, becoming uh, altogether, because of the figures, a uh, European problem. There is a huge amount of the money in uh, the so-called financial perspective of the European Union, European budget for next seven years, 2014-2020. All countries where, uh, where youth unemployment is higher than 25%, can apply for this money, so uh, it is not the cost of the national budgets, which are mostly empty. And uh, it depends on the skills of local governments, how to use this money, how to get this money, how to apply, and how to create uh, opportunities or new jobs for the young people. So the European Union as a union is fighting this problem, but still there will be millions of young people still without a job during the next years. And uh, this is a well, regrettable situation for the countries and for the individuals. My advice to those who are in this um, situation, I was also, after my studies, I was also un unemployed, so I know how, how, how they feel. My advice is not to, not to waste time. So uh, they, they, if uh, you should, you are not able to work, then study, study uh, because uh, knowledge you get through your studies is something which is making you uh, sovereign. So nobody can steal this from you. They can steal your money. They can steal your house. They can steal your car. But knowledge you, you, you get, the education, it is yours. It's, your, it's part of you, part of your identity, part of your future. Thank you. Uh, I want to continue on the same subject. Now, do you think that additional of more countries in the Union will worsen things as financially and also and economically? Also, there are some complaints, at least I've, I've um, I've heard those complaints that people are not really um, asked about their opinion, not really been taken as uh, as a whole whether to join or not. So they they're part now of the union. And when there is a problem, the problem goes back to the people, not to the top or the politician that have actually have made this decision to join the EU. What do you think? Well, there are different cases because, for instance, in my country, in Slovenia, we, we organized referendum voting uh, before entering European Union and 90% of the people, it was huge, it was huge turnout and 90% of the people voted in favor of the European Union. So in Slovenia, this was popular decision, mm -hmm. it was not decision taken by the government. Also, some other countries did, some, some other countries did not. Uh, normally now, in those countries where people decided you know, yes. to enter European Union, the support for the Union is much higher because <laughs> people, people feel responsible for this decision. Yes. For those countries where somebody else took the decision, they, they blame them. So it's, it's, it's different. So uh, democracy matters. So democratic mm -hmm. process matters. Uh, this, is, this is clear proof. This is clear proof of it. But uh, but despite also in those countries where the, the well, support is for the European Union or for the membership of a specific country uh, in the European Union is, is not very high, there are still no, no uh, significant political forces which are uh, really advocating uh, exit of it from the European Union. So there, there are parties which are speaking about it, they are critical toward Euro and so on. But so far, with the exception of the, of the United Kingdom, 
that they are speaking about the referendum yeah. uh, to mm-hmm. to uh, well, abandon the European umbrella. There is no other country where this is this is seri- this is a serious issue. Also for the United Kingdom, I don't believe they they will uh, they will go out because they, they have good position. Because in some politics they are members, in other politics they are not. So they have the privilege uh, which is not the case for new member countries. Mm-hmm. So all new member countries uh, which entered in 2004, Slovenia was part of this uh, big bank enlargement, or those countries who are still in the waiting room, they have no choice. They can enter uh, and with uh, member- membership they accept the uh, whole Lisbon Treaty without exception. So there is no there is no uh, well, uh, comfortable position as it is take, uh, as it uh, was taken by United Kingdom or Denmark or some other countries mm. which which uh, negotiated so called opt out positions. Sure, I wanted to ask you a question regarding the issue of nation branding. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for countries today is very often a country is presented one way abroad. It's perceived another way abroad. And the reality is sometimes something even different. Uh, I know under your first term as prime minister, you had a very successful campaign uh, called I Feel Slovenia. And I was just curious, first of all, why do you think that campaign was so successful? And secondly, what would your advice be to other countries, let's say, in the world who are considering nation branding as, as an option? Uh, what are the most important characteristics or the most important strategies uh, for a country to actually improve the way that they're presented abroad and perceived abroad? Well, we, when we introduced this slogan, uh, I feel Slovenia, uh, Slovenia was uh, preparing for uh, European Union uh, uh, leadership. Uh, Slovenia was first new member country which led uh, the mm-hmm. European mm-hmm. Union. This was a huge task for, you know, a country of two million people. Uh, we were three years of members. And, uh, well, this situation also created, uh, well, creativity. <laughs> of course, the creativity part, uh, one of the results is also this, this new branding, national branding, which was, uh, well, the government uh, announced public tender, and then the, the people proposed different slogans, different uh, images, and so on. And uh, well, at the end, um, we chose this slogan: "I feel Slovenia." Um, somebody discovered that uh, name of our country is the only name written in English, name of the state, uh, where the the word "lau" is included. So, I feel Slovenia. When you combine different colors and, and <laughs> characters, is uh, well, multi-telling, uh, uh, multi-telling slogan. And uh, well, when we introduced it, there was also huge opposition from those who said, "Well, uh, this is in English. It should be in Slovenian. If you write this slogan in Slovenian." Mm-hmm. It sounds different, so <laughs> we said, okay, but uh, we, are, we, are, we are selling those touristic capacities and uh, well, the can- image of the country, no, not to us, we know it, but for, the, for the, uh, the rest of the world, so they will understand much more if it is in English. Uh, so after a few months of debate, uh, they had settled down. And the slogan was was uh, well, very 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 uh, widely accepted, and not only because of it, also because of the people who are working in this branch. The tourism in Slovenia since then uh, has had positive growth. Mm-hmm. Also during the years when we we faced huge huge recession drop of the economic growth, the tourism grow by grow by about, uh, five, three, five, sometimes even uh, even higher percentage, which was uh, a blessing for us. So national branding is important. So it's uh, creativity, 
is part of the, how to say, part of this uh, industry, maybe this is not proper word, but without creativity you can have the same product, material product, but you're not able to sell it uh, with, with some additional value, added value. Okay. Hey, 